Two Johns, one repentance. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Brothers and sisters, we are graced to have the miracle-working icon of Our Lady, the Theotokos, here with us. And later this morning, His Grace, Bishop Nikolai, will be presiding here in the temple, representing His Eminence, of course, Metropolitan Hilarion. We're actually fulfilling something that's biblical and ancient early church, which is we're gathering around and readying ourselves in this place to hear the bishop actually open the scriptures and preach to us. That would be happening if it weren't for the vicissitudes of the pandemic, which necessitates, demands that we split the congregation in half so that we can control our numbers. In a sense, this condition that we're living under asks us to become schismatics for the sake of bodily health. And under the regulations of our local government, it asks us, mainly you right now, to come into church in the form of bandits. <laughs> But that's not going to stop us. Though we're divided by law, we are not divided in faith. And though we're masked and having the appearance of criminals, in fact, there is actually a truth in this. It should remind us, first of all, number one, how fragile we are. Because if we are having to cover up, no doubt we're trying to protect others from ourselves. So the medical community tells us. But there's also a human sense here that we're actually defending ourselves possibly through the good offices of cotton or some other fibers that somehow will be protected from something that is utterly invisible. In fact, as you know, there's a debate in biology that virus, it's not even clear if they're alive, that these things don't qualify as living organisms, and yet they have power. And so we live the way we do in the hope of a better life and a better, a better living. In other words, a hope of a human type of resurrection, which would be called going back to normal. It's the resurrection of a life that we remember, and hopefully it won't last too much longer because some of our children are starting to forget what it was like, and we need to return them to the paradise situation, which is pre-pandemic. But of course, we're not in paradise. As you know, we're in a fallen world. We live in a very difficult world. And thank God, and I have to be brief this morning, thank God that he provides us ways to remember paradise and to hope for a new paradise. The coming of the icon is one of those ways. Another happened a long time ago. On a dusty, lonely road, a very old man, perhaps in his 80s, is in a cart being taken to the shoreline. I believe he is departing from Ephesus, a major city today in the coast of Turkey. They load him up on the boat. They send him out, not too far away, out into the sea to literally a rock. This thing is barren. It's one of those many volcanic outcroppings in the Mediterranean, near Greece, it's called Patmos. And when he got there, he realized, oh, this is called exile. And it was. And they left him there. And this man, of course, is John the theologian, the John, the author of the fourth gospel. And what sent him there, among other things, were these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God full of grace and power. And there was another named John who testified to the word. John recalls John the Baptist. John the theologian recalls John the Baptist in the very first paragraph of his own gospel to remind us that the testimony of the gospel is on the authority of a living human being who in the opening, opening lines of the Gospel of Mark says, Behold, 
the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. What a great way to open a gospel. And John, very conscious of his Jewish background, but also his Hellenic position in the world, when he says, in the beginning was the word, in arche hen logos, in principium erat verbum, for all of his audience, that summons the very first sentence of Genesis. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. It all comes together. And for this, among other things, he's exiled. And that becomes his deep repentance. By this time, the Theotokos, she has already died. Remember, she's in his care. He cares for her. And she most likely was with him in Ephesus, right to the end. And so with her departure, with her dormition, he goes to exile. And John the Baptist, let's not forget, after having proclaimed the revelation of Messiah, the salvation of the world, for his trouble he will be invited to a wedding feast, and at that moment come foul with Herodias and Salome and will shed his blood. And I'm really happy, to be honest with you, to be associated with, to be assigned to a church, because there are not many, that is named after the beheading of John the Baptist. It means we don't get a happy feast day. We don't get a celebration. We get a fasting day. For some reason, some mysterious reason, John of Shanghai, who founded this community, dedicated us to the beheading of John the Baptist and that shedding of blood. Patmos, Salome, Herodias, blood, it's all one repentance whether it's of the bloody kind or of the long-suffering kind, whether it's the, I need more patience at home to get through this ordeal called living close together day in and day out. I need more help because the kids aren't going to school yet and they're, quite frankly, driving me crazy, some people say, though we love them and they're our treasures. I need more help because I'm searching for work. I need help, Lord, and I need hope because my future and my employment here in D.C. and around in these environments called DMV, we don't know. That's a type of repentance. That's a road to walk on. And the Lord is providing it for us, believe it or not. He's providing us a difficult road for our salvation. I wish it could be different. I wish it could be, as some atheists say, why didn't God just snap his fingers and save everybody and call it done? And a believer said to one of these atheists who made that remark, by the way, that's a blasphemous remark, and that's a sermon for another day. He said to him, and the man's name, the atheist is Christopher, and the man said to him, and the man speaking his name is John, by the way, a scientist, he said, the problem with you, Christopher, is this. You don't understand how suffering works. And it hit him, because this Christopher is quite a rhetorician. This guy knows, de oh, he does debate. He's deceased now, but I still like him. And at that moment, you could feel the arrow coming in and striking him, because he had already gone through some struggles in his life, a divorce, separation, etc., 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 and was now coming into also a cancer diagnosis. So when he was told by his interlocutor, Christopher, you don't understand suffering, and that's why you can't snap your finger and call it done. And for the first time over many videos, and you can see them on YouTube, Christopher Hitchens was paused. It stopped him for a moment. Then he recovered himself, got back into character, resumed his argument, and they powered on. But it was a wonderful moment, because in that moment, you have the one road of repentance opening up. And in our moment now, we have the two Johns, our patron, our patron, 2.5 Johns, John the theologian. And on Patmos, what happened? He received the apocalypse, what we call the book of Revelation, occurs on Patmos. And so what evil had done for evil, God turned the evil for good. He produces this masterpiece of Christian revelation in an exile. And so, brothers and sisters, 
May you be about your own individual small masterpieces. Come through this difficult moment, and may you come through in faith and with courage. As they say in the secular world, get through it in style. And may God bless you in that. Get through it. Put your feet on the one road to repentance. Use this time action to come back to the living God and repent. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.